Hello, my name is Trey Torrance, and welcome to Can You Manage Me Now? Humanizing Configuration Management at Scale. Uh, I'll be talking today on lessons that we learned at Twitter, modernizing a nine-year-old puppet code base. So, to get things started, sort out some AV issues, there we go. Uh, let's address the five Ws first. Who are we? Uh, well, as I mentioned, I'm an SRE at Twitter, but specifically, I work with two teams there, one of which is the Core Infrastructure Services SRE team. That's the team that manages Puppet, LDAP, and a number of other critical infrastructure services for Twitter. So what is happening with Puppet at Twitter? So we are in the middle of a number of initiatives. Uh, most of them are focused around making our code base more manageable, more approachable, and uh, a bit easier to reason about. Along the way, we've had to solve a lot of problems that we incurred from tech debt. As I mentioned, the repo's nine years old, and we've got a pretty large scale of both hardware and code uh, to deal with there. So, sorry, uh, where are we going with it? We are trying to figure out how to get ourselves out of a mixed Puppet 2 and Puppet 3 environment, uh, which we've mostly solved. Once we're done with that, we're going to be looking at how we get to Puppet 4. Uh, we'll also be talking a little bit internally about what we do with some legacy operating systems that have made this particularly challenging, uh, and a number of other unrelated issues, uh, most of which are more specific to us. We won't touch too much on those. So uh, when did this start? As I mentioned, about nine years ago uh, is when Puppet was introduced at Twitter, and about a year and a half ago, the work that I'm talking about today began. Uh, that's around the time I joined, but there were already other folks there that had been scoping this work and uh, trying to wrap their heads around it. And why am I talking to you about this? Why is this relevant to you? Uh, well, we're certainly not the only company that has struggled to keep up to date with the Puppet language, and we're certainly not the only company that has struggled to manage the human side of this, which is making that code base something we can all work with, something that people can sort of evolve over time. Uh, so let's address the problem space a little bit. At Twitter, we are dealing with the scale of millions of lines of code, uh, several thousands nodes, hundreds of contributors over a given quarter, a couple of different coding styles, uh, which is just par for the course with a code base this old. Uh, best practices here for writing puppet code have changed, and they didn't keep up so well internally. And as I touched on, we've got disparate agent versions. So uh, when I joined, we had entirely separate stacks for Puppet 2 and Puppet 3 with dedicated masters for each stack. And a node either got its catalog from a Puppet 2 server or a Puppet 3 server, but the same code base was being used across both. That led to a number of incompatibility problems and, and other headaches. Some more things about our problem space. Our code base could be described as actively hostile towards its users, especially about a year and a half ago. Uh, in particular, data types are sort of a mess for us, and I know, again, we're not alone here. Uh, like most uh, large Puppet installs, we have an ENC that we use. It was written internally. And it is sort of like early factor in that it only returns string data. So if we have Booleans stashed in there, that leads to a lot of what you see here, uh, where maybe we'll try to find some attribute, use a default value of string false, and then compare it to string true and see what happened, uh, or the inverse, or the latter, which actually doesn't work due to some software bugs in the ENC that we wrote. Uh, and all of this leads to a lot of confusing code for newcomers, especially if they have no exposure to Puppet. Uh, Folks that do have exposure come in and wonder why we're not using string to bool, uh, and there were actually some reasons there, but we've tried to make most of those go away. Uh, we also have a lot of 2i style integer conversions in our templates for the same reasons. Uh, and here are some quotes from our users. Last week, a security engineer told me, I ran Puppet, and it painted me a Picasso. He was describing the errors and logs that spewed out from that Puppet run. Uh, Ramin, one of the fellows who has done a lot of the work to improve things here, and who some of you may actually know, uh, as he's pretty involved in the public community, has also said that our code base is sharp and pointy by design, 
uh, or was. Uh, in any case, it's hard to reason about probably by accident. Uh, I'm sure that the original implementers had the best of intentions, and there's evidence that they stayed on top of upgrading Puppet and keeping with some level of best practices and community modules for some time, but at some point that fell apart. So now that we've sort of addressed the problem space, let's break it apart, factor it out into some smaller pieces that we can address individually. Uh, based on everything I just described, the, the components I chose were code hygiene, uh, meaning things like duplicate code, linter errors, uh, style problems, et cetera. Coding best practices, these are gonna be things like the role profile model that has become really popular over the last couple of years, um, making nice with the autoloader as its expectations have changed since nine years ago. Uh, and also software lifecycle management, getting ourselves out of this situation where we have Puppet 2 agents, Puppet 3 agents, different features may be available depending, uh, some, several native core Puppet types added parameters for Puppet 3 that aren't around for Puppet 2. So it, we have to sort of code defensively uh, in the current situation. So now that we've got our components, uh, let's talk about how we're gonna solve this. What is our plan of attack here? Starting with the code hygiene, uh, mostly because it's going to be the most straightforward, non-unique uh, problem that we have, and it has almost nothing to do with the scale of Twitter or anything that you might consider a Twitter problem. These are just basic things that we really failed to do early on and had to pay for once we reached Twitter scale. Uh, so in particular, we had to go through uh, and identify a lot of duplicate code. We haven't finished that, and I'm not saying that you should either, but it's good to start by finding the painful parts, uh, the packages that are redefined in 10 or 12 places, or uh, other important pieces of your infrastructure that weren't made flexible enough in their first module to be reused well. And so people have gone on and just picked the pieces that they thought they needed uh, and pulled those directly into their role modules or somewhere else. Uh, once you have that duplicate code, at least some of it, uh, in particular, a good example that you can use with your users going forward, refactor it, break it out into modules. This is, again, something we all pretty much know. It's pretty standard puppet advice. After that, we moved on to scoping our linter violations, and that was where things got a little overwhelming for us. Uh, I wanna say we had tens of thousands of linter errors on our first pass, which was a little scary. Uh, so for us, that's been a very iterative process of making amends with some of the linter checks that we can't run right now, uh, like stringified booleans, because we're not quite done solving all of our ENC headaches, uh, and turning those off, and sort of tackling the ones that were more benign, more related to formatting at first, and turning more and more lint checks on as we went and as we eradicated uh, the violations that we were already checking for. Uh, and by that, that's what I mean by increase your linter compliance. Uh, again, I'm not saying you need to go from zero to 100% uh, compliant, but get some groundwork laid, uh, and in particular, fix some things so that you have code to point people to. Uh, and obviously, something we should have done ages ago uh, that we didn't and that we still pay for today, enable linting and SCM hooks. Uh, today, we still haven't been able to turn it on in a blocking fashion because we're afraid of giving users a bad time when they check in a minor update to a file that already had linter errors. Uh, so we want to avoid situations like that until we've removed a lot of those pitfalls for our users. Uh, so, with the coding best practices, how are we going to solve that problem? Um, first off, we decided to adopt role profile or something uh, very heavily inspired by it. We already had the notion of roles at Twitter. It was just really the profile piece that uh, we did not have. And if you're not familiar with that, Gary Larizza is on, eh, presenting on it in the next session, and I would highly recommend going to that talk if you don't know much about the role profile model. Uh, so, uh, ultimately, without Summarizing his entire talk, profiles encapsulate some business logic so that you can say, this is how my company configures Apache. Not necessarily for the web tier, but just in general. Maybe we need Nagios monitors, et cetera, et cetera. So you put those things in your profile level, and we had not done that in the past, and we're working towards doing more of that now. Um, 
The other thing that we found was a little painful. We had a lot of what are called multi-resource stanzas. And if you haven't been writing public code for that long, you may have never seen them uh, because community practices have moved away from that. But effectively, it led to greps like the one here on the screen where I might look for anything using the foo module. And the first two results that I get here, I have a, a bar role, it's including the foo module. I have a baz role, it's including the foo module. I have a quux role and it's doing something with foo, but I don't know what type of resource that is. Uh, and I have no real way without either rerunning this command with a different set of arguments or diving into that file to really know what's going on here uh, versus today where we would tend to write package and foo on the same line. So uh, now we're getting into customer education. And this is the part where I think might be a little more novel to some folks. Uh, so the advice that I would have here, be the code that you want to see in your repository. It's probably a little easier to write the code that you want to see in your repository, though. Uh, but again, what I'm talking about here is create examples. Curate better modules. You don't have to rewrite the whole code base to find a few really complex modules that satisfy a lot of use cases. Refactor those to represent the way that you think your organization should be writing this puppet code. And then you can start populating your docs and your other user support avenues uh, with these examples because people will cargo cult and you're not going to stop that. And so as a result, you should probably focus on giving them something that's worth cargo culting uh, instead of millions of lines of conflicting examples. So once you have that done, uh, you can start sort of reaching out to your users and, and trying to correct bad behavior that you see. And there are a few ways to go about this. Um, and this is what I mean by mingle with the people, of course. So you should start probably by opening up some type of communication channel if you don't have them. Now, for small shops, this slide may be a little less useful if you only have four people writing puppet code in the company. A lot of these pain points might not be uh, something you run into. But in our circumstance, there are about eight people who operate Puppet as part of their job responsibilities, and about 90 other people that sometimes have to write Puppet code, but don't know a lot about how to do it or what they need to do. Uh, so start reaching out to those people. Establish a mailing list if you have those people. Establish a chat room, uh, some place where folks can come and ask for help specific to this, not just a general, oh, go ask the team that manages it uh, how things are done, because that can easily get lost in the noise of everything else that that team might be doing. Uh, another thing that we found really useful in our case was setting up office hours. So once a week, uh, Ramin, who I mentioned earlier, and myself, and sometimes other teammates, are available in a common part of the office. And we're just there if someone wants to come by. Uh, some days we'll do outreach and try to convince specific customers to come by. Uh, and if folks are remote, then we make sure to book a room, set up a video conference. But the point is we make it accessible for our users to find us and to ask for help. And they know more or less, it's been hard to communicate this, but the notion is catching on that once a week, there is a time where you can come and ask your puppet questions if nothing else worked for you. Uh, and folks will be there that will sit with you and actually try to work through it for an hour. Uh, and that brings us to teach them to fish. So once you've talked to your customers and you've seen some of their problems, if you take the time to actually understand their problem as they perceive it and not as you perceive it, uh, then you can sort of establish a better rapport with them and you can teach them what's wrong about the way they were approaching something, how they might approach it better uh, without making them feel like they have screwed up along the way. Uh, that's been, you know, it's easy to get that wrong. I think the first time that we actually invited a user to our puppet office hours, they thought that they had showed up for the puppet inquisition. They weren't quite sure what was happening. Uh, they looked very nervous. And so that sort of taught us to, if we're going to reach out directly to people and say, hey, you look like you need some help with puppet, that we, we need to be a little careful with how we approach that and say things like, you seem to be having trouble getting, you know, accomplishing your goals and you're reverting a lot of code. It's probably costing you a lot of time. Why don't we see if we can take an hour and fix all of that and let everybody move on? We also have to deal with upgrades. 
We did not do a good job of that for years, and it has been a giant pain point. As I mentioned, we had two separate tiers, one for our masters and one for our agents. Or, sorry, one for Puppet 2, one for Puppet 3, each with their own masters. Uh, upgrading the masters was definitely the thing that we, we identified as the most valuable there. Because as I mentioned, there was some code that would simply not work uh, with Puppet 2, but these two tiers shared a code base. So uh, we started scoping the work to migrate our masters all to Puppet 3 and have all catalog compilations happen against Puppet 3. And there is no, um, some folks in the room may have dealt with this before. Uh, if you have, then you're aware that there are a lot of scope changes uh, that happened in that particular version jump. We don't have a silver bullet for solving that. There is no magic answer. There was a lot of iteration. There was a lot of uh, custom branches being used to, to test what would happen if we tried to migrate a rollover with no op runs. And while those aren't perfect, that would sort of raise our level of confidence to the point where we felt like we could switch one rollover to the Puppet 3 tier. Uh, that took several months, but once we got all of those roles moved over, then we were actually looking at one feature set in our language, by and large. Uh, and for us, that was pretty huge. In the past, we had had two on a good day, three or four on a bad. Uh, so once you unify your masters, we found that the agents can follow if they need, and it's a lot less painful, um, by and large. We do have some legacy OS issues that prevent easily updating the agent there, unless we are willing to build our own Ruby and things like that. Uh, and we're still sort of debating internally whether it's best to follow the upstream EOL of those distributions and just not invest significant time into solving that problem, or if it makes sense uh, to invest a few weeks, maybe a month of engineering effort and build our, our own full omnibus style packages for, uh, for Puppet there, including Ruby, including maybe SSL, whatever we need to make the stack work. Um, but we haven't really made decisions there because, again, once we got everything over to that one master backend, things got a lot less painful for us on the day-to-day. -day. Uh, the other thing you've got to do here is you've got to future-proof the process. If your Puppet upgrade process looks like this administrator goes to the Puppet repository, manually downloads the package, moves the package over to this internal repository, bumps some manifests to roll that new package version out, you've got a recipe for never upgrading your stack. That's what you've got. You don't have a process. You have a recipe for failure. Uh, a better process would be user creates a CI, a, job, a CI job. CI job watches the Puppet repository upon changes, pulls in new packages, maybe kicks off a job to run some, some sanity tests. Uh, whatever that process is, minimize the human involvement. Obviously, you may not want it to be fully automatic, but you need to make it easy. Once you're ready to hit that button, there should really only be one or two buttons stopping you from, from rolling out an upgrade, at least to your first environment. If we had done those things nine years ago, uh, we might actually be all the way to Puppet 4 by now, but we didn't, so we'll have another year or two's work ahead of us, probably. And now I'm gonna touch on source control migrations. Um, mostly because it was in the abstract for this talk. At the time that I submitted the abstract, we did intend on completing a migration by, I believe, September, October. Unfortunately, that slipped a little bit, as some ambitious projects sometimes do. Uh, I don't think anyone that has worked on a significant migration would be too surprised to hear that it's gonna slip by a couple of months. But if you're gonna bite off something like that, uh, I would caution you to do it for the right reasons. Uh, in particular, evolution is a good thing. Everyone's pretty aware of this, and revolution is not. Uh, but let's dive into what that looks like in this case a little bit. Uh, for a source control system migration, for us, we started on subversion. We're trying to move to Git. Good reasons for that move, better tooling. Uh, internally, the company has better support for Git, and that's just the facts. So it makes sense to align with that for us. Uh, we also get a better branching model. The way that we set up our, our subversion repository left us with a very clunky branching model. And it, many of us maintain several separate checkouts just to get our jobs done. It gets a little painful. 
uh, and time consuming. And if you're on a slow link and you need to update seven of those checkouts, you're having a bad day. Uh, some bad reasons for upgrading? Well, it's, it's good enough for the Linux kernel, so it should be good enough for us, right? Um, or isn't Subversion like, really old and not popular anymore? Or, hey, I've only ever used Git or HG, uh, Mercurial, rather, or Bazaar. Um, those are relatively bad reasons, especially for a company at our scale. Uh, just because one user has better experience with a, a certain tool does not necessarily mean that we should force that upon our team and our 100 users. Um, so really consider that as you consider some of these more uh, potentially controversial changes to your infrastructure. Right? Think about what you're actually getting and what your users actually get. And if you're the only one benefiting, then it might not make sense to do. At some point, someone's gonna come by, maybe the boss, maybe somebody else, and they're gonna ask you, are we done yet? Can we stop with this? Can we assign you somewhere else? Can we just stop dumping man hours into Puppet? We've spent just, I have no idea how many weeks on this, and it's time to move on. Well, I have some news for whoever asks you that question. You're never there. The answer is always no. Uh, those who don't learn from the past are doomed to refactor it over and over and over again. People seven or eight years ago bit off chunks of this work at Twitter. They didn't follow through, and as such, from our perspective, it almost appeared that it never happened, right? We couldn't really benefit from their work on those areas, uh, in those areas in any meaningful way because the entire ecosystem around what they had done had changed to the point that that work was invalidated. You've got to keep growing your code. That's part of infrastructure as code. You can't write a software product, release it, and never touch it again. Well, some folks may try, but it, it often doesn't work well. And if your infrastructure is code, then the same thing is going to be true there. You cannot expect to just write it once and walk away and never maintain it. Um, I would highly recommend if you're at our scale, maybe dedicating a couple of people, not full time to it perhaps, if that doesn't make sense for you, but making sure that you have uh, three, four, maybe more people that develop significant expertise that they can help your users. And between those three, four, however many people, you should have enough man hours to do your basic upgrades, to stay on top of basic uh, lint changes, style changes that the community may make, uh, or at least decide if you want to internalize those changes. Uh, if you don't staff that, you will pay for it at some point, uh, unless configuration management is a toy in your environment. Uh, I'd also like to stop and thank for a minute uh, several people that helped with this. Uh, Ramin, as I mentioned, has done a huge amount of the work on this. Uh, more than I could really wrap my head around personally. Uh, another teammate of mine, Jesse, uh, has been around long enough to, to understand a little bit about why the code base got to be the way it is. That's been hugely valuable as we try to understand what we need to do to fix it. Having someone that has a, at least a little bit of context uh, goes a long way for us. Uh, our management also really supported this effort. Uh, they funded a lot of time fixing this over the past year. And without that, this would not have worked. This would have been a giant failure. Uh, today, we're in a world where we are running about 15 lint checks, uh, and we've got it down to considerably less linter errors, under 1,000, I believe. So things are much better today than they were a year ago. Uh, and we're constantly trying to turn on more and more checks, occasionally even trying the future parser against the code base to just sort of see what happens. Uh, obviously not in a production environment, but testing the waters a bit. Um, and I'd also like to thank PuppetConf for hosting this event uh, and, and giving us the space to talk about what we've done here. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn it over because I frankly think this should be more of a discussion. Uh, our problems are not your problems. But I am hoping that if you're having similar problems, you can learn from what we dealt with uh, and not have to repeat everything that we did. So if there are any questions, please go on.
Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, question about your source code repository and then uh, like your different puppet environments. So do you have like one SCM repo that handles like your lab and your QA and your prod or do you have individual source code repositories for each puppet environment? Um, SVN branches currently are the solution there and Git branches will be when we're done with the migration. Okay, thanks. Hi. Um, so uh, earlier in the talk, you mentioned that um, there were maybe like eight people on your team and then 90 others that occasionally contributed to Puppet. Um, how did you learn to trust those 90 others that probably weren't Puppet experts? Um, personally, I think the answer is that you stop worrying about trusting them and you start worrying about mitigating the, the inevitable problems that will come up. At the end of the day, if you don't fundamentally have faith that everyone at your company is trying to get work done that needs to get done, you have a much bigger problem, in my opinion. Um, and especially at our scale, we have to sort of accept that and move on at a certain point. In certain contexts, that may not be appropriate, uh, but I think in a lot it is. Now, once you've sort of made peace with that, uh, it sort of becomes about trusting that the intent was good, right? And trusting that you can dig yourself out of any hole you dug yourself into. And in particular, I think that minimizing the feedback loop is really important there. Uh, having visibility into when something breaks is hugely important. So for us, we track, uh, at our team level, it doesn't make sense to track the, uh, the wealth of metrics that I've tracked in other roles for Puppet. But we do track things like how many roles are failing Puppet runs, uh, catalog compilation failures as well. I anything where it looks like there might have been a huge splash uh, radius for the damage, those are the things that we really stay concerned about. At our scale, we have to accept that if a user goes and breaks their role, they can deal with that or engage us as they need to. Um, and obviously, if you can structure your code to make it a little easier to contain that damage, uh, which is something that we didn't do very well early on, but that we're trying to improve now, that, that does a great deal to help, so not having a base module that more or less does everything you need other than install Apache um, is probably a good idea on that front. Another thing that we did do uh, on that topic is we did restrict certain modules. So we have sort of a layer seven uh, ACL system for our, for our repository. Um, and we only allow our team to touch specific modules like the old inherited base module, for example. Um, things that we think that you're more likely to do harm than good. Uh, we have locked those down. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, everyone.